Good afternoon from my side. Uh, it's good morning for others. Uh, we have a good afternoon and I'm sure we'll have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. We are here with the fourth workshop in the series of uh, decolonizing EdTech. In this case, we have decolonizing EdTech research and the use of existing evidence and data from Africa. And we have our presenters here who have come and we, we are so happy to have them. We have Lucy Hetty, who is the CEO for ISA. And we also have um, Latte Lawson, uh, also the senior research manager in ISA. I, I think sometimes uh, when we introduce people, we always um, either underdo it, overdo it. So I'll let them introduce themselves when they start. And I'm handing over uh, to you. We shall be um, asking you to give us feedback about the session. So we'll be sharing the link and then we'll share it again at the end. So thank you for joining and over to you. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And so thank you to Emerge and EdTech Hub for inviting us to give the fourth um, seminar in this series on decolonizing ed tech research. I'm here, so I'm, as Irene said, I'm Lucy Hedy, I'm the CEO of ESSA and great to be joined by my colleague Latte, who is the Senior Research Manager at ESSA. So in the talk today, oh sorry, my slide is not moving. I think, apologies. Okay, here we go. So today we are, we, we will spend most of the time talking about how do we decolonize education research through use of existing evidence and use of existing data from Africa. But before we get into deep into that conversation, I'm going to just going to give you a quick introduction to ESSA so that you know who we are and where we're coming from and what we, we see as the purpose um, of the presentation today. And then I'm going to ha hand over to my colleague Latte, who's going to take us through the more content focused sessions. Just to warn you, this is an interactive um, session, so there's going to be a couple of breakout groups where we will ask you to discuss some of the issues that are coming out and we'll also want to hear your ideas for how we can improve um, use of existing evidence and data. So first of all, a bit about ESSA. Um, our vision is one of high quality education in sub-Saharan Africa that enables young people to achieve their ambitions and strengthen society. And our mission starts with universities and colleges. And we are all about connecting data and evidence from Africa to drive improvements in education for young people. And so we want to be connecting that data and evidence with people who have the power to make change in the system. And for us, that is policy makers, it is education leaders, um, researchers, uh, young people themselves. And so we, as I say, our focus is on universities and colleges, and we do a lot of work really connecting evidence and data to university leaders, to um, higher education policy makers to try and improve and strengthen universities and colleges across the continent as they look to improve access, quality of education and young people's transition to work. But what I want what we're going to be talking to you about today is the work that we do with researchers in those universities and colleges to strengthen what we call the knowledge ecosystem for education. So how are we strengthening the field of education research so that that great power of education researchers across the continent is being um, harnessed to improve education for young people at all levels. So the purpose, the overall purpose of this um, seminar series is around decolonizing edtech research and Latte in a moment will go in in a bit more detail as to what that means from how, how we, what we take that to mean. Um, 
the series so far, I've I've been attending a few of the previous series, has really focused on empirical methods. So as you're designing your um, field work, as you're designing your data collection, how do you decolonize that process of empirical research? We're taking things from a slightly different angle in that we're bringing a decolonial lens to the use of existing evidence and data. How can we use existing evidence and data from Africa to frame and inform our research in a way that supports decoloniality? We don't, certainly don't claim to have um, all the answers. So what we'll be presenting today um, is our approach and what we're doing to um, help change the dynamics. But it's about starting a conversation. And I'm pretty sure that everyone here has some thoughts to, to um, go around, go about decolonializing uh, research from this perspective as well. So we are very excited to get your thoughts during the breakout groups as well. So I am now going to hand over to Latte, who's going to go in a bit deeper to the issues. And Latte, when you want me to move a slide forward, you can just hold up your hand and I'll do it. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Latte Ayao Lawson. I'm a research manager at Education Sub Saharan Africa, and I am from Togo in West Africa, currently based in Bavaria, Germany. So I'm very happy to be here in this conversation about decolonizing education or education research broadly. So um, I'm going to talk about why we do this and how we do this specifically, as long as education research or tech research is concerned. So it is well known that coloniality affects knowledge production and use. And existing literature on the topic showed that uh, the visibility of research from Africa is mediated by the legacy of colonialism. The researchers have also indicated that uh, the global system and hierarchy of academic productions is dominated by researchers and publishers based in the global north, which position African research as a peripheral concern or phenomenon. Uh, globally, we know that our data shows that Africa's contribution to global research is around 3%. So we contributed to 3% of global evidence. And the research coming out of Africa is underrepresented in the global research and policy debate. So in such a context, if you want to work in the area of education research or tech research, what do you do? Uh, to decolonize evidence use on the continent. So uh, the way ESA sees the problem is the following. Please, Lucy. Uh, yes. So the way you see the problem is the following. Um, if you want to solve African education pro uh, problem or challenges, you need to use evidence that has been generated within the continent and by researchers who understand the context in their research work. So our goal by doing so is to increase the visibility of the research generated by African researchers so that that research can be used to strengthen society. And doing that, we also try to identify research gaps so that researchers and uh, decision makers can have conversation about what is needed and where are the priorities area to invest in. So we also promote a community of education researchers, a debate between you know, the researchers, decision makers, and other stakeholders to enable a dialogue to improve learning on the continent. So our approach specifically to achieve this objective is through a product we created that is called the African Education Research Database. Uh, please, Lucy. So um, in 2017, in collaboration with the Real Center of the University of Cambridge, we created what is called the African Education Research Database. So what is it? On a continent where the evidence generated is not available, is not publicly shared, and people are not aware of it, you want 
a platform where you can put all the evidence on the same, at the, you know, at the same place and run analysis of the evidence and share that evidence publicly so that people on the continent or researchers from, from abroad are aware of it and use that evidence as long as the debate is about African research or active research in Africa. So uh, this African Education Research Database is a collection of more than 5,000 research uh, publications uh, coming out of 48 countries in Africa, excluding South Africa. And the, the idea of it is to use the metadata we collected about that research, like the country the research is from, the topic the research cover, whether it is ed tech research, whether it is visual technology in teaching, how technology improves teaching and so on. So we collect the research and then we use a kind of metadata analysis on that research to produce the platform. So the platform is available free of charge. It can be used by stakeholders on the continent and abroad to understand or to pick up relevant paper on a specific topic as long as education or edtech research is concerned. Uh, for example, to use it, mostly me when I'm, I'm using about it, I use the country and the keyword to search for what I want to know or what I want to gather evidence about. So, so that is our approach, for instance, to promote or to raise the profile of the evidence that is generated from Africa. So most people ask the question, why are we doing this? And why do we want to do it only for African researchers? So we're doing this for African researchers for the reason I gave you before. The evidence coming out of Africa is underrepresented. So sometimes when it's come to run what we call general equilibrium models or this kind of big tools uh, to make policy decisions, people use data or evidence that are not from the context. So the idea is to give, is to put out there a platform that save you time and put at a, you know, a platform where you can assess evidence from every single country on the continent. And this cover different languages, French, English, Portuguese, uh, and so on. So that is the why we are doing it and why the focus is only on Africa. It's for us also about the colonizing education evidence and raise the profile of evidence generated by African-based researchers. Uh, next slide, please proceed. So, uh, how have you done, or have you, how have you done this? So, to build this kind of platform, we develop firstly what we call a methodology to capture academic publications using databases, Scopus Web, Web of Science, among other databases. We also develop a strategy to capture the great literature, like book chapters and so on. And then we construct stakeholder experts based on the content for recommendations. And then we have been updating that process on a yearly basis so that the database is up to date. So experts can use you know, uh, the database uh, by searching for literature when they are conducting literature review. They can also use the database to uh, gather background evidence on a specific context in, uh, on the continent. And uh, when it's come to the time we cover, we have started doing this. Or we, we went back to 2010 and the database had been annually act, uh, act, updated so that you know, we capture everything from there. Some questions are like, why don't you go further? Yeah, we want to go further, but you know, the, the work involved in this, you have some idea about it. So uh, some criteria for this are like the, Publication to be involved on the platform need to be co-authored by a researcher based in the continent. So we know, yes, it is about decolonized ethnic research. You can publish something about Africa, but from outside of Africa. Uh, such a publication will not be on the platform. It, it is about raising the profile of African research produced by Africans. So one of the co-authors needs to be based in a local institutions. Uh, and the publication also need to fulfill certain quality criteria. It need to be published in a, in, a, in a journal that has some quality criteria. So briefly, that is you know, how we use, how we, we build the platform. So uh, on, also on a yearly basis, we have been gathering evidence about the use of evidence from Africa. 
So uh, feedback from some stakeholders, among other um, UNESCO, for example, used the database in its advice to education ministries on the continent. Uh, students and academics uh, in most of our yearly surveys report that they use the database in their teaching and also in their research. And some people, uh, some funders like Imaginable Futures, Ekinda Giving, and so on, they use the platform and the background document because on a yearly basis, you also publish a kind of update of it so that uh, a kind of summary of what has been updated and what are the lessons coming out of the platform. So the funders use a sort of document. Uh, a question? No. So funders also use uh, the platform to support their work. For example, this has been used last year for organizing the Forum for Education Research in, for, and by Africa in April 2022. So these are the feedbacks we have from uh, organizations, students, academics, and even from the uh, United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to education about how they use the platform. Uh, yes, of course, the platform also has its own limitation. Uh, please proceed, next slide. In terms of limitations, for example, we noticed recently that English uh, publications are overrepresented. But this is fair because if you look at every single database out there, you notice that uh, the language of research also in the continent is being English. So how are we going to solve that? We don't know yet, but it is one of the limitations of the platform because it is also about decolonizing and tech or educational research. Uh, some of the great literature is being excluded. Why? Because we have some issue to rate them in terms of quality. We are not sure whether uh, uh, a working paper, for example, published by a researcher somewhere on the continent, fulfill the quality criteria to be on the platform. So we are having a conversation about how to do that, how to include the great literature. Um, a lot of manual work is involved, like it is very difficult to automate it. Like to automate this platform, for example, you need to have um, to use technology so that the technology capture the literature published uh, within a year for you. But at the same time, that publication to fulfill a lot of criteria. And you also need to collect a lot of metadata about the single publication. So it's very difficult to be, you know, to automate uh, the platform. This is, we, we see it at, as a limitation, but we are working on it to make the work um, easier. So, um, you know, we have added a filter to open uh, for open affairs publication. For example, some of, uh, most of the publications are published in journals that are not in open access. So to handle that, to deal with it, we, op we add a filter. People can search for open access publication directly within a specific area. For example, ed tech research or technology in education. I can only go for open access publications if I want to. And yeah, we are still exploring the possibilities to automate uh, the platform. Um, uh, an ongoing work that I am involved in myself is the French and Portuguese speaking uh, publications. Uh, so we are working to improve the share of uh, French Portuguese, um, early child development, uh, foundational learning, uh, you know, uh, publications, so that we have a kind of platform who, that is not, on, not only about higher education, but also cover early childhood education. Uh, so briefly, that is ESA's approach of decolonizing education research or ed tech research, raising the profile of research published by African base in Africa. Um, thank you very much. I will stop here. But well, let me ask Lucy if she has um, something to add. Please, Lucy. Uh, sorry, it took me forever to find the unmute button. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much, Latte. Um, so as as I warned, we have we have a breakout session um, where we have some questions that we would like 
you all here to answer. But before we go into that, we wanted to hear, do you have any um, questions for clarifications or comments for Latte? Okay, so it looks like you're off the hook, Latte. No questions for you. Um, so, oh, there's just something appeared in the chat. Oh, great, very clear, good. Um, so, we're going to, I'm going to ask uh, Jakob in a moment to put us into breakout groups. And what we would like you all to discuss in those breakout groups are the following questions. As you undertake your research, do you deliberately seek out literature from the Global South to frame your research? And if so, how do you do that? What are the techniques you use? Are there particular databases you go to? And then leading on from that, what suggestions do you have for improving the use of research from local contexts? Now, we'll be asking you to report back when we come back. So when you get put into your breakout groups, please nominate someone who's going to feed back to the group. I'm just going to exit from the full screen for the presentation because I'm going to put a link in the chat to um, a jam board that I've put together to um, where people can take notes. So let me just get the link for that. And I'll put, put it in the chat. So when you when you get put in your breakout group, please so please click on the link here now. Um, and when you get put in your breakout group, you should see that there will be um, a slide for each group. And I, if you could go to the slide that's um, called use of evidence. So each group has one called use of evidence or use of data. And this is the first one about use of evidence. Any questions before I ask Jakob to put us in breakout groups? No, fantastic. So Jakob, could you put us into three groups, please, for 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and discuss. Yes, uh, Lucy, uh, it looks like it wants to create four groups. I hope you don't mind that. And I'm just reconfirming reconfirming that you um, are keeping this group open for 15 minutes. Yes, that's right. So four groups is absolutely fine. And um, right. let's do 15 minutes. All right, great. I'm going to open all the rooms now. Three to one.
Lucy, you're muted. Lucy, you're muted. Oh, geez, you'd think I'd have worked that out by now. Um, thanks, Matt. So um, thanks, everyone, for coming back to the main session. It'd be great now if we could just go around and share a bit from each group um, what was discussed, what were the highlights from each conversation. And um, if we've captured those highlights in the Jamboard, then that's something we can synthesize afterwards. Um, but it'd be great to hear. I'm going to share my screen so that we can, I'll have the Jamboard up as people talk through. Um, sorry, I'm on my group. If we go group one, who was nominated to report back? From group one. I can't see any hands, so you'll have to shout out. We didn't nominate, but I can self nominate. Did you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, go ahead, Maxine. What were the um, highlights from the group conversation? Uh, so we all agreed, the four of us agreed that we do deliberately seek out literature from African contexts. Um, not all of us have access to pay subscription services, so we end up searching on Google Scholar, ResearchGate, Academia.edu. Academia.edu, there's a spelling mistake there. Um, and other strategies we use is directly emailing authors or join mailing lists. Um, and then also through our personal network of researchers, just like reaching out to them um, for their work. And then suggestions for improving the use of research from local contexts, um, if existing databases could have filters, like maybe by country, for example, or just different filters that you could use. Um, you could have a, an online community of researchers where you openly share work. Um, and then maybe just shifting the status quo about expectations around citing people from African contexts versus people from other contexts and kind of pushing back on reviewers who insist that you cite more people from Western contexts. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks, Maxine. Um, really powerful ideas in there. Um, can I invite. Um, someone from group two to talk through the highlights of your conversation. Is there anyone from group two on here? Sorry. Good afternoon, my name is Amar. Um, I'll be representing group two. So basically what we spoke about was um, how we collect our data and um, we concluded that we mostly um, get data from either partnership with organizations that have that data. Um, most of us also agree that um, our data come from deposits, individual deposits, from people that are willing to share that data with us for our research, and um, also cluster groups, cluster groups where we organize our, um, communities or a group of um, the audience that we're working with, and then we get that data ourselves. Basically, we, that was just the conclusion. Thank you. So, so really interesting, reinforcing like the importance of these informal networks um, to, to get the evidence. Can I go to group three? Yeah, hi. Um, it was only two of us that were speaking in group three um and that's weird because we put more on there than you are showing at the moment there's more on my screen worth of oh group shall group. i try refreshing maybe that's oh there you go there's some stuff oh, there. Okay. um so the so uh, yes we both seek out global um south literature um where at all possible uh, Eric was saying really interesting Ghanaian background, but living in Canada, and of course Canada as a colonial state, a bit like Australia, you know, with with its own issues with its indigenous peoples. So there's a, there's a quite a lot of interesting facets and ways of looking at, at it from there, and that, that was a really interesting conversation. In terms of the literature search, there's a really useful um, decolonizing edtech thing. Uh, Taskeen, who's with us today, has been a big part of setting up and doing so. 
Um, that's worth, if anyone hasn't seen that, that's worth going to and having a look. Also, if you haven't come across the Eric site, which has a huge range of grey literature uh, and stuff, that's also worth looking at. I'll, I'll put that on, on the list as well. Now I've thought about it, it's really good. A couple of other points that we made, um, in terms of looking at you know, understanding local contexts, it is definitely vital that we value it and seek it out deliberately rather than try and encounter it in the literature. Um, but we also wanted to make the point um, that just being done in Africa doesn't make it decolonial. You know, academia as it is currently constructed is very colonial. It's very, you know, it's a very, very much the Western hegemonies of, of things like how we are published, how do we hear those voices that are outside, on those margins, on those, in those different, um, you know, different ways of thinking and ways of learning and ways of valuing learning. How do we get those um, if, if we're constantly reading the same, you know, it's the whole point of these workshops when we originally set them up months ago was to get the voices that we never normally hear. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that um, we know that. And I, I'm going to bring Eric in because I think his voice is more important in this. But there was another point that we had that we wanted to share. Uh, yeah, thanks, Matt. I, I I think you've actually hit on it. I, I you know my point was basically that because um, I'm I, I'm Ghanaian, I live in Canada, and um, my work is on um, uh, the Black experience in uh, in Canadian graduate education. So I'm in an adult education PhD program. Um, and and I and I find that you know because uh, I I'm using a, a kind of a decolonial theory as my theoretical framework, uh, and so when I'm when I'm doing literature searches and and, and all that I I I try to find um, writing that is um, you know in, in cause decolonized like that you know uh, uh, scholars that are working in that in that field, and I find that uh, you can find scholars scattered you know. All over the place now. Most of the scholars that I have come across, um, I, I I find uh, do not live in the so-called global south, um, uh, and and yet they do work that's related to to Africa and 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 most parts of the global south. And 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 you find that there's quite a lot of um, uh, good uh, uh, thinking in there. So I I was saying to Matt, for example, that in Canada, uh, George Sifadai at uh, U of T, uh, Oise, for example. I mean he. That's a lot of work with uh, African indigenous knowledge. He doesn't live in Africa; he lives in Canada. Um, but then he he works a lot with. Uh, I know that he's done quite a bit of work with some uh, African researchers from the University of uh, uh, Education in Winnipeg as well. Uh, but I, I think my point was that uh, when, when I was listening to uh, Latte, you know, talk about the criteria for inclusion in the database, I because uh, I I felt that that's uh, one of the things he said was that you have to be. Uh, in Africa to actually be included in the data, which I found really very limiting because I found uh, there are quite a number of scholars scattered, you know, all over who are doing real work that would be considered decolonial research. Uh, that would be really very beneficial to African researchers as well. Um, and, and these are people that are also, you know, clearly African. They identify as Africans wherever they go. Uh, and so I, I, I thought that that, that was really, you know, uh, quite uh, quite limiting as well, and and maybe that that needs to be looked at uh, again. But but yeah, I, I you, you, yeah, kind of yeah, we had an interesting conversation. With that. No, that's really interesting. Thank you, um, Matt and Eric, both really good challenges. I think I'll I'll respond just quickly on your point, Eric, about how much great work there is being done um, by. Uh, diaspora outside of the continent um, that, as you say, I think it perfectly could perfectly be described as decolonial. Um, and we wouldn't dispute that at all. Um, our database is, just, is set up for a particular purpose and to deal with an issue of a particular problem, which is the lack of visibility of research. Um, which is being led from institutions within Africa. I agree. So it's not going to give you the full universe of research that is being done with a decolonial mindset. Um, and it, so it's a challenge that we we often get and we think it's important to consider. I think we haven't yet thought about how, how you would go about um, doing that. Uh, I think it's a lot of painstaking work, but actually at some point it might be worth um, 
thinking about how how one identifies work being done by the diaspora outside of Africa as well. So thank you for that point. Um, let me move to then group four. And I think that's Pakenam, you volunteered from our group. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so for group four, um, we discussed that uh, most of us, yes, we deliberately seek out literature from the global south to frame the research we're doing. And um, that is either uh, through using publications in uh, different platforms. And then we try to um, trace back um, who worked on it. And if possible, we reach out to organizations or African researchers themselves, but also through work. Um, it's important to develop partnerships with other research organizations um, that are focusing um, on uh, global south or working in uh, the global south themselves. Um, but some of the challenges we also discussed in that is that sometimes it's really very difficult to find um, sources with a strong empirical data and there's a lot of gaps. Um, and um, sometimes it's also hard to find um, um, published research online everywhere accessible for everyone. One of the other things was that um, the global south as a term is actually very fast, vast and it can be a bit superficial. Um, and many times the context based is um, neglected and that is something that should also be taken into consideration. Um, and then for the other question, if literature research techniques, particular databases, yes, that's also covering the first question. Um, then other things we also discussed was how when it comes to um, research being available, one of the challenges or the barriers is that there's actually a lot of research available by in the global south, for example, in Africa, um, Francophone countries specifically and North African countries um, don't have not necessarily that don't have the platforms, but most of the time you can find it translated or accessible for everyone. Um, and then for suggestions on improving the use of research from local context, it's to ask partners, it's to publish more in open access journals, and also to demystify the word research itself. It doesn't have to come from an institution or a university. Um, we can use evidence from local schools or teachers themselves. Fantastic. Thanks, Pakenham. Um, so, well, Thank you so much for all of those feedback and insights. And I love, every time we talk about um, the AARD and what we're doing, we just always hear, I, I always learn something new about what others are doing. And so we'll certainly make sure that we're capturing these lessons. And what I, a particular theme also I feel running through this is, um, yes, if you're trying to access more research from the global South, that, you know, that is something you're trying to get from the system, but then also by having done that hard work of having aggregated some of that background, then you have something that you can give back to the system as well. And it's food for thought in terms of how can, how can we all, when we've gone through that process, how can we all help others to use um, what we've done so that we can further raise the profile of that research? Um, Pakenham, you talked about um, issues of data, and we're actually now going to move on to, I think, is an even harder issue than using published research from Africa, which is using data from Africa. So I'm going to stop sharing now this, and then I'm going to start go back to sharing the presentation and hand back over to Latte. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for your contributions. Um, this journey of decolonizing education research, tech research, and data is a difficult one. And we all need to share our experience so we can learn from each other. Uh, now we are going to talk about decolonizing the use of data. So I have been searching for definitions from different authors to see what people capture under decolonizing uh, data use, or what is data colonialism, actually. So 
Um, the, the ones I like the most is this definition I you see on the screen, which uh, is the process by which an organization claim ownership and privatize data. So on the continent, the task of decolonizing data will be a very difficult one. Because not only this is not only about external organization, it's not like the use of evidence where we, we at SI can say that we want to read the profile of a specific research or a specific group of researchers. But even the researchers on the continent can be actors or stakeholders privatizing data. So the question for us is then similar to the African Education Research Database, where we capture the evidence on a single platform and share that evidence publicly with people. How do we expand data sharing and use culture on the continent? So we know a lot of problems exist. The data is available somewhere, but hard to find and aggregate. Sometimes data is, you know that it has been collected, but it is not systematically shared within the system. So how do we go about, about it? That is the question uh, we have been trying to answer at ESSA. Uh, please, Lucy, can I move to the next slide? So, um, when it's come to sharing data in a systematic way, can we say that academics are worse at sharing data? Or can we claim that you know, international organization or evaluation agency are doing better? Uh, we, we are not sure about it. But uh, research or uh, existing research, empirical research showed that uh, 92 of sub-Saharan sub African researchers agree that they would like to use data from other researchers if the data were made accessible. And only 38 notice or mentioned that, you know, they have been sharing their data about on private basis, like per email, sharing data, I've done that myself. So we are all, 38% agree to share the data privately. But then our recent analysis of the African Education Database, looking into the data that people are using in their research, in their empirical research, showed that less than 5% of publication in the, in the database use pre-existing data, which means secondary data. So we can see here that secondary data is not being largely used. And one of the explanations for that is that it's not publicly available. Uh, in my own work in April, I went through 200 uh, PhD theses published uh, in Kenya to see that none of the uh, pub none of these publications or uh, the author none of the author is sharing the data he used in his own publication although the data had been collected by the author himself meaning that yes academics are also not good at sharing data although we all agree although we all agree that we want to use secondary data or we are ready to use it but we are not also not good at sharing the data I guess everyone here is involved in that we, uh, we are all part of that we are not doing it in a systematic way. Uh, please listen to the slides. So uh, how do we then expand on the continent a culture of data sharing and use or reuse, if I, if I may say that way. So um, after a series of uh, conference we organized uh, in 2021, uh, we noticed that one of the approaches that we can use to answer the question or to expand data sharing on the continent is to build a community of practice. So we initiated a group we call the Unlocking Data Initiative. ESA is part of it, Tech Hub is part of it, Zizi Africa in Kenya is part of it, uh, some other organization in Cameroon, Malawi, Burkina Faso, we are all part of it. So the idea of the Unlocking Data approach it will increase the effectiveness of its members in their effort to unlock education data in their local context by increasing its availability and use for analysis. So I'm going to talk a bit about the main questions supporting that work and what are the specific that have been done on the topic. Uh, please proceed, next topic. 
So we all agree that work is needed when it's come to the data aspect of decolonizing the use of data on the continent. So what do we, to, to do that, a uh, true question has been structuring the work of the Unlocking Data Initiative. The first one is, what do we know about what exists? What are the gaps? What more do we need? And then how do we understand the data ecosystem so that we can start advocating for something in the system? So uh, answering those three questions, we have started what we call uh, an activity case studies in Kenya, for the TVET data sector in, uh, in Malawi, also in uh, Sierra Leone, led by Etec Health. So we have developed tools, for example, when it's come to a local country, a country of context, for example, we developed some tools to map what we call the data. Like, I want to know about TVET data in the, in the Kenya context, then I will map the data available for a period of time, similar to what we have done for the AERD, the African Education Research Database. We want to map the data over a, a period of time, ask people to share their data, and then initiate a platform similar to what we have, where the data will be publicly shared. So the tools we develop to do that, we call them uh, the data map methodology, the guidance you know, for mapping data. These two are available on the platform of, of the Unlocking Data Initiative. So uh, briefly, that is our idea of decolonizing the use of data on the continent. So that once we connect stakeholders at the country level after mapping data available for, uh, 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 you know, over a period of time and connecting these stakeholders, then everyone knows who is collecting what data and who has collected what data over that period of time, that will initiate a conversation about sharing data. Because everyone that is prioritizing a data is in the dynamics of data colonialism, like the definition says before. So our approach to it, uh, that, uh, that is what I just explained to you. Uh, but then I also wanted to share some platform. We have been looking for a platform. For example, I am a, a researcher that produ who produced a research paper using data I collected. So how do I share the data? Because the review, maybe the, the, the journals, uh, it is the report. No one asked me to, part, to share that data. But how do I go about sharing my data systematically so that everyone can assess it? One way is to put in my own research, for example, like the data and script used to produce research is available somewhere, plainly in the, in the research paper, in the report, or sharing it to uh, some platform that we think are doing a great job on the continent. Uh, I will talk about, I will talk here about the APHRC platform for micro data that are sharing a, a research data systematically to be used or reused by researchers. And in this journey, I also came across a platform uh, that is called, I don't know how to pronounce it, researchtreedata.org. Uh, which is like a platform that uh, holds a, a single data repository in several countries. So I think this is a very good initiative where people can also share, know about who, uh, you know, where to share data and share their own data. Of course, our work in the area of, you know, uh, data colonialism is has its own limitation. I know people, you know, uh, people. Uh, do their people, you know, have their own strategy to do this. But then the question is, what are the, the experience that we can share with us here? How have you been have you been doing this, and what you can share with the with the group? So, uh, Lucy, I will stop here. Thanks, and back to you. Thanks, Latte. So, as Latte says, we. We are going to want to hear from you. We're going to go back into breakout groups to um, discuss those questions of how are people here finding and sharing data. Um, but before we do that, again, wanted to give a bit of time for any questions.
Okay, I can't see any questions, so we'll move to the breakout room. So, um, again, oh, I can. Is there something in the chat? Oh, that's you, Latte, distracting me with a comment. Um, so before, um, so we'll. I'll ask Jakob to put us back into our groups. Um, as before, we were discussing um, how we were finding and using evidence. This time, we're going to be talking about how do you look for data to ensure you're, um, you're not duplicating, that you're filling in gaps. And then this question, do you share the data you collect? And if yes, where? Um, and if not, what could change this? I think we all know that sharing data is not straightforward. So how, um, what would help to, to change the dynamic and change um, what Lato was talking about earlier, that actually, if we look at data sharing, it's often academics who are the worst in terms of following good practice for sharing data. Um, so if you could go um, do I need to share the Jamboard link again? Would that be helpful? If I go and type in here. Um, I see a couple of people, Jakob, uh, leaving. So I wonder if we would go into, is it possible to go into three breakout groups or is four the minimum? Uh, Lucy, I will um, see if I can organize into two, three breakout rooms. I will manually uh, just distribute uh, participants that are, that are, that are low, low in a room. Uh, right. I think I can do, do that. Great. And if actually, could you put us into, could you do it just for 10 minutes? Because I think 15 minutes will overrun. So if you could put us into uh, three groups for 10 minutes, that would be brilliant. All right, let's do 10 minutes. All right, I'm going to open the room. Thank you. Um, hi Lucy, you seem to be talking, but I think you're on mute. Did you hear anything I just said? I'm so sorry. I thought no. I thought I was off mute. Um, so well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I hope you all had good conversations in your breakout groups. We're going to do what we did last time. I'm going to ask each of the four groups to report back on the key key themes coming out of the conversation. So um, if I could go first to group one. Hi, Lucy. Oh. That was, <laughs> hello. Um, that was John and I. Um, I can I can start and then John can add if he, uh, if he has anything more to share. Um, we were a bit naughty. We kind of steered a little bit off the, the topic. Um, 
but we but we kind of stem from the fact of like um uh like sort of where you're looking for data and then kind of like looking at when we do research we actually look at research papers so like in your literature review you might look at a research paper rather than the actual data to understand and that's sort of the the sense the the direction you'd go to to find that data mm -hmm. um so um, and that kind of spun off into a conversation, which I think is quite important about the fact of like accessing data without accessing or without looking at the context of the conditions that that data was collected in. So when you have a research paper, it can tell you the limitations in the bias or what natural disaster might have happened at the time. And so just looking at raw data might actually be a little bit dangerous. Um, and so trying to keep those coupled together. And then we were kind of looking at, you know, the quality of data and those problems that stem from it. So uh, like both of us reflecting because we've both been involved in like data collection processes where the, you know, the actual enumerators or the quality of, you know, teachers putting in data might not be that great. So how do you um, look into the, the quality of, of that? Um, yeah, so I think that's what the main conversation was. And the second one, we didn't get to the second question, but I personally have not shared qualitative data before. And I really, as someone, Lucy knows, this is one of our major projects. Like, I don't know how to share qualitative data, right? Um, I, I wouldn't begin to know how to sort of uh, make sure that it's not going to get anyone in trouble or anything. So, yeah, I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you, Tasky. Yeah. Um, really interesting issues there uh, some things just about giving basic about you know basic advice that people need for sharing platforms but then also these broader implications and it, that was touched on in my breakout group as yeah. well around I think there's something about the ethics of sharing yeah. and, and to be doing ethical research on secondary data what does that mean yeah well actually one one uh, thing I did want to add is like I just wrote the quote of like if you torture the data it will confess some of you might have heard this um, phrase before if you've done like you know your research but you know it a whole thing with unlocking data is about telling the story and data can tell different stories as well so that's another thing yeah. to be aware of yeah. data and words the, yes you can use both to tell whichever story you want um, can I move on to group two Who wants to speak out from group two? Uh, yes, I will do that because we forgot to nominate <laughs> the speaker for the group. So um, we have a very you know, com uh, inter interesting conversation about um, how to share data and people share their own experience. Uh, from AMA uh, based in Nigeria, it's difficult to share data actually. Uh, because you want to be very careful about, you know, anonymity, protect identity, and so on. So that that's what makes it impossible to share qualitative data. But when it comes to quantitative data, um, you want to make sure that you protect, you, protect, you protect the identity of the responders and so on before you even try. Mm -hmm. But on a, on a, from previous experience, people mentioned in the group that, you know, the data that you use uh, can only be shared on, privately or they have been sharing data only privately. So which, you know, uh, speaks to the, the, the presentation uh, I made before about the number of people actually sharing data on a private basis. So sharing data on public basis is something I think is not in the culture yet. So we are trying to do it, but it's not there yet. Um, so uh, a final point has been made by, uh, colleague from Nigeria who mentioned that sometimes the data you use for your research is not comprehensive enough to be shared publicly because the data is tailored for your own research, your own need. Like you want to understand something specific for a project, you collect data to do that. And once you do that, you are not confident enough to share that data because you don't know how useful it is. So that's also some of the reason why people don't share their data publicly. Mm -hmm. So these are the two elements of that I can share with you. Thank Thanks you. So and back much. to you, Lucy. Thanks so much, Latte. So again, I think these two themes emerging. One is 
some like lack of con comfort in terms of data being shared out of context and the ethics around that and then the other just around needing that which can be shared needing more practical um guidance on just how to do it okay i'd like to invite group three and i'm conscious of time so um maybe if there are just additional points um to pick up are you there group three uh yes uh hello oh, um i uh oh sorry i'm gonna turn on the video uh, sorry. Yeah. So we we uh, we also kind of veered off a little bit. Uh, I um, well, not veered off entirely, but we kind of were we're talking about you know what data actually means, and and we ended up talking about how uh, quantitative data and qualitative data seem to be really very different. Yeah. Uh, and so when you uh, the question says, where do you look for data to ensure you are not duplicating? I think many times uh, you know the scientific so-called scientific establishment uh, makes it seem as if um, uh, quantitative research is uh, uh, more rigorous than qualitative research and all that. And, and, and so uh, when it comes to uh, uh, data and, and when you use words like you're not duplicating research, it basically means that when you've collected data and you've answered a particular question, then if uh, uh, somebody else uh, is kind of trying to answer a similar question, then uh, you know, they, they might, they have to be careful, otherwise they, they'll be duplicating, uh, uh, you know, something that has already been done. But when you come to qualitative research, it's really quite different uh, because, you know, you could be looking at the same thing, but from, you know, very different perspectives because uh, experiences are unique. And, and if you're looking at lived experience, you could actually uh, be uh, looking at uh, similar questions and, 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 and similar, you know, data, et cetera. But then uh, you have a totally different uh, way of, of actually looking at it. So, so that's where we, we, we looked at, but, but just to add that in, in my own situation, I mean, here in Canada, I find I, you know, Lucy, you mentioned uh, ethics and all that. I think that's a big one. Um, I was involved in research, uh, looking at the black experience in undergraduate, um, uh, Canadian institutions. And this was about three years ago. It's a, a federally funded research. And up till now, I, I, and because I've been wondering, uh, you know, where did it go? Where did it go? I, you know, it's taken, you know, three years. And even those of us that were on, on the research team, uh, we have not actually, you know, we, we know what we did and all that, but it's not been publicly available yet. Mm -hmm. And it takes uh, so long because of uh, some of those uh, ethical implications. And then, uh, you know, particularly here. I mean, I don't know what other countries are, but 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 here that is taken really very seriously, and so uh, and I'm sure it's the same uh, uh, elsewhere. So so yeah, I, I I would say you know those are some of the things that uh, we, we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. Thanks, Eric, um, and Danielle, who got paired with me, so she she had to I had to put her on the spot and talk about her own experiences for group four um Danielle is there anything you would add to the conversation I'll try to be as fast as possible and okay where did I collect my data I was I was doing PhD research I got access to a MOOC that students were taking from all over the world um uh the did I share the data? Yes, I shared the, the process data, which uh, is required by the institution I was going through, the OERU. It was required to be published in open access journals. But um, also um, the raw data, since it's a, since the raw data is from a MOOC, the, the, that information is available to anyone to look through if they go through uh, my publications, well, that are not yet out there, but uh, to, to see the information. Um, and I think what there is to change, I think uh, it's the ethical issue of uh, when we're public, when we're releasing data openly, um, we have to be aware of what type of information we're sharing and uh, the, the students who agree to be a part of any ethically approved research, they might not fully understand the implications of their data being being uh, published globally. So uh, e even if they they sign informed consent uh, sheets. So uh, yeah, I think it's a matter of having important discussions about ethical approval. And partly, uh, an issue, one one issue that I had was that um, the ethical board that approved my research didn't necessarily know much about open education. 
and and open access and and you know making making research uh, freely available everywhere. So I think there's a lot of uh, ethical things to to discuss about um, releasing data openly. Thanks, Danielle. Really interesting food for thought. We're we're over time, um, so I will. I'm going to take the. The moderator's privilege and just add in one additional issue that I've seen that hasn't come up through the conversation, but um, often funders require researchers to deposit data in a in a public database that can be accessed. But from a what is surprising from a decolonial perspective is um, those. Uh, repositories may not be open to researchers based in the country of where that research was undertaken. So, for example, any work funded by the UK government um, has to be deposited in a UK social science data archive that is only open to UK registered UK research institutions. Um, and so I think there's there are big barriers in terms of thinking about how we share the data, um, ethical issues and practical issues, but then also people who've overcome those issues, even those repositories might not be available to researchers where that research is, um, was undertaken. And so it's not adding more to the body of knowledge that is used by researchers within that country. Um, so I just uh, left for me to say, uh, a big thank you to everyone. Um, thank you all for staying right till the end and for being so generous with your insights and open in the conversation and the challenge. We will take those points away um, and I hope you will take those points away as well and reflect on them. And I want a big thank you to Emerge and EdTech Hub for organising the series and supporting us um, to deliver this seminar and yeah, to, I've just noticed in the chat, there's a quick uh, feedback form that it would be great if you could all open the chat, click on that form and give us feedback on the session here today. Um, so I, if Irene is here, can I hand back to you? Uh, Irene oh, has yeah. uh, had to leave a bit earlier, but, uh, but I'm still here. <laughs> um, Lucy and Latte, thank you for, uh, for a wonderful session and uh, it's been many uh, great, uh, like, great insights, and uh, it's been really, um, really very interesting to be part of this. Um, from my side, uh, yes, thank you for mentioning the short survey. Uh, also, encouragement for me is just five questions, um, and it's data that we keep and share with the Tech Hub only. Um, yeah, not much further from my side. Um, and I'm wondering, I see, since we have Tuskeen here, if uh, you would like to say something on behalf of Etika. Um, well, yes, definitely. Thank you, Lucia and Latte, for the great presentation. I think I might just do another like reminder and plug that the, the reason that we have this series is for our, uh, you know, to encourage more research on like decolonizing education and decolonizing ed tech, decolonizing data. Um, we have like a special issue right now that we're looking for um, submissions to. So I think if someone can pop that into the chat, um, yeah, it would it would be really great if people consider thinking, even if it's not for our special issue, but think about publishing and writing more about this. So these these types of conversations aren't just something that happen on the periphery. Uh, but yeah, thank you everyone and have a great evening or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Tuskeen. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for taking part in this session. Um, I think I'm going to leave the room open for uh, three to five, say five minutes more, and then I'm going to end the session. Yeah.